Hello, everybody. This is Irma Jennings, and some of you know me, some of you don't. I'm going to tell you very quickly who I am. I've been in the osteoporosis space for about 12 years. Um, my business model has shifted. First, it was all about food, and now it's about um, being a osteoporosis navigator. So I help my clients find doctors all around the country and find DEXA tests and trabecular bone score and Echolite. Um, I introduce them to functional practitioners all around the country, and I advocate on calls with them, which I am here in the city. We'll be doing that tomorrow at Hospital for Special Surgery. So we are here with Dr. Kim Zambito, and I'm thrilled to have her. Um, a little bit about how I came about to Echo Light. As I had mentioned, one of the people on the call, Cheryl, introduced me to the, uh, the thought, the idea, and I pursued it and had my own echo light done. Um, I have DEXAs done every two years, but there was something that was re really niggling in the back of my mind about my DEXA, which was, how come it's so good? And one would just completely celebrate that because my bones look very strong. I'm 71. I was diagnosed with osteopenia in my 50s. I was told if I don't take Fosamax, I, you know the drill. If you don't take the medication, then you're going to go um, downhill quickly. And I, and I didn't. So I did everything that I could do. Many of us are on that path. Um, but my DEXs was getting stronger and stronger. And I was like, why is that? So then I had um, the echo light done and it revealed something very important to me, which was my L3 and L4 were osteoporotic. Um, although my score, my overall score, score on my sky, spine is still osteopenia. And uh, Dr. Zambito pointed out what was going on. I had certified densitometrists see it. I had a um, an X-ray of my spine to see what it was, but it, it 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 was very difficult to discern. My doctors, my regular endocrinologist at Penn, never brought it to my attention that I might have arthritis. So that that brought us to this moment. Um, I don't know if Dr. Bush is on the call, right? Should I see if he's on the call? Let me see. I think he said he might be a little late. He was um, driving from the office to home, but he will be joining us for the okay the for the chit chat. Okay, so um, Dr. Zambito, do you want to talk about yourself? I why don't you introduce yourself? I think that that would be the best thing. Absolutely. Um, my name is Kimberly Zambito. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and I subspecialize in hand surgery. Um, my background in undergrad and graduate school was exercise physiology, so I always had a passion for healthy living. And then when I went into med school, I combined the fields of women's health and orthopedic surgery, which some people thought I was crazy to do, but um, it's it's so important. It's such a good marriage uh, between uh, the two um, subspecialties, women's health and um, orthopedic surgery. So. I was always interested in bone health. Um, Irma knows uh, my background in terms of my military service. I was deployed many, many times and osteoporosis care, bone health care requires, you know, consistent care. So I, I partnered with endocrinologists and rheumatologists and uh, OBGYNs um, to provide bone health care for my patients who came to me because of broken bones. Um, and now, now my military service is over. I, I started engaging in that side of things. And that's when I came across the Echolite REMS. I felt DEXAs were, were just not giving us a great picture or enough information when it came to bone health. And so I started using the Echolite REMS technology because it gives us information on the bone density as well as the bone quality. So I wanted to say two things because you, you quickly passed over. You said that you were deployed. Um, you had two tours in Afghanistan. Is that correct? Two to Afghanistan and two to Iraq. So um, you've seen you've seen part of life that we only read about and hear about on the news. So um, there's that other level that uh, Dr. Zambito brings, which is her level of compassion. Um, and also you had taken the test to read the DEXA, the um, remind me, remind us all what that test is again. So I took the course. I haven't taken the test. Mm -hmm. um, the course is put on by the ISCD, um, mm -hmm. International Society for Clinical Densitometry. 
it's a really well done course. It's two days, um, very comprehensive. Um, I would highly recommend it for, for anybody who's interested in understanding um, the science and um, the application of, of DEXA. Fabulous. Okay. Now, um, anything else you want to say? Or are you complete? That's it? Uh, I'm good. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you can take over. I think you could take over and do your slideshow. Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to look for the screen share. I see share screen. So give me one moment and I will pull up. There we go. That's what I want. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes. Wonderful. So let's get started. Um, for those of you who have seen the advertisements um, across social media, Dr. Bush and I are traveling for an event um, in St. Louis. And this is essentially the similar talk that I'm going to give there. Um, so you guys get treated to something a little bit earlier. Okay. Um, I know Irma does a great job educating everybody um, on osteoporosis and osteopenia. If there are some slides that, that I think um, most of you prob probably already have more than a fundamental um, knowledge base, I'll just pass over those slides. Okay. So let me see here. So th this talk is imaging for bone health assessment. And this is, I also gave this talk at a different level for a grand rounds presentation at St. Luke's University. Um, so I try to interject um, for this particular talk, a little bit of science, but not too much. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead. I think I go dot. Nope. Yeah, there we go. So the goal of the talk is to develop a foundation of knowledge about imaging used for evaluation and monitoring of bone health. Um, I want you to all understand that imaging is important. Uh, it's, an, it's an instrument to aid in the diagnosis and management of osteoporosis, but you have to consider that you are an entire person and imaging is just one piece of the puzzle. So many times people um, come to see me and they're so focused on the DEX and what the DEX is telling them that we really have to back up and really focus on the entire person, um, the big picture. Okay, so just to review, osteoporosis is a systemic skeletal disease characterized by low bone mass and microarchitectural deterioration of the bone tissue, and it can lead to increased risk for uh, fragility fractures. DEXA gives you information about the bone density, but does not give you information about the microarchitecture of the bone quality unless TBS is included, and we'll go over that in a couple minutes. Osteopenia is not a diagnosis, it's a definition or a description, and it's a description for low bone mass or decreased calcification of the bone without a clinically increased risk of fracture. Ironically, most of the people that we see who have fractures um, are in the osteopenia range. Isn't that interesting? Because if it's it so wrong, right? So it's interesting because um, uh, I'll go over a few things in future slides in future slides to kind of shed light on why it might be that people with us in the category of osteopenia are the ones to fracture. Um, so we'll go over that in a few minutes. Um, I think most people on this talk know that there are risk factors for osteoporosis and there's factors that you can change and factors that you cannot change. And the factors um, that we can modify include our nutrition, our physical activity, maintenance of muscle mass. That's so important. Um, eliminating or decreasing the use of alcohol or illicit substances, um, hormones. And I have medical conditions and the factors that you can change, but it depends on the medical condition also to take into consideration is there's a number of drugs or medications that we prescribe to treat certain illnesses that can be, um, um, that can injure bone or decrease bone density. For example, um, for mental health disorders, lithium can be prescribed that has a deleterious effect on bone. I'm just going to give that example and that that's a whole other talk. <laughs> Okay. And there's various ways that people work up. A lot of times we work, I like to do a very basic workup that's fairly comprehensive. And then I'll dive into something a little bit um, more in depth if I need to, but everybody, every subspecialty has their way of approaching things or their lens of approaching things. So 
Somebody may order more bone turnover markers. An OBGYN might order more um, reproductive hormones or sex hormones. So um, the key is that you at least get a very basic workup and including a physical examination. And I think um, orthopedic surgeons um, are more adept at musculoskeletal exams and other specialties. So when I um, examine somebody, I look for the presence of kyphosis, which is that exaggerated hump in the back. Um, some people think of it as slouching, but it's more than that. Um, I look to see if the patient is able to get up from a chair and, and walk a distance and then come back and sit without plopping down, because that gives me an indication of their physical fitness and their, their muscle, um, their, their presence of muscle, no atrophy, no sarcopenia. And then we also look for loss of height over time. Okay. As an orthopedic surgeon, people will ask me, can x-rays show bone loss? Um, 30% of your bone, bone loss has to occur in order for um, x-rays to really pick up that maybe, you know, significant amount of bone loss has occurred. There is a um, type of measurement called x-ray absorptiometry. Um, it's an insensitive measure for bone loss. Um, x-rays are taken of the metacarpals and the phalanges, and then a computerized image processing is applied to the x-rays um, to evaluate for bone loss. It's not really recommended as a screening or a diagnostic test for osteoporosis or osteopenia, but sometimes when people come to the orthopedic surgeon for knee pain, ankle pain, somebody may say, oh, your bones look a little thin. Um, and then that's when we would recommend as orthopedic surgeons, hey, you need to get your DEXA scan or you need to get some sort of imaging so that we can make sure that you're optimizing your bone health. So DEXA, this is what we're all familiar with. Um, it is considered the gold standard at this time. Um, central and peripheral sites are used, so that's the spine and um, the proximal femur or the hip and also the distal third of the um, forearm, okay? There is radiation exposure, but it's such a small amount. You, go, you get more radiation exposure from going for a walk outside than you do during with a DEXA. Okay, this is a little bit, this side talks about the science behind DEXA. I'm kind of going to skip over it, but I think the important thing um, to glean from this slide is that when you get a DEXA report, oftentimes your physician is just looking at a report. You really want to get the full report with the images included. Um, and I have that highlighted there. Obtain the full report and the images and insist on that, okay? They should be able to burn a disc for you or print out the images. But that's so important, especially if you want some Somebody to critically evaluate your DEXA when it's just a, a typewritten page with T score is this and you know Z score is this. It, it's kind of it doesn't give us all, the whole information. That being said, not every physician understands how to critically evaluate a DEXA. Um, a minimum of two years is typically required to measure any changes in bone mineral density with the DEXA, so it's not incredibly sensitive, and then you also have to be aware of the least significant change. So I, the way I describe this is you want to know, is this change real or is this change not real? Because every DEXA machine has its own bit of error or, or wiggle room. And so you wanna know what that least significant change and a complete report should have the least significant change listed on the report. DEXA, so the ISCD in the course actually states that there are 90% um, of DEXAs have, DEXA reports have errors. Those errors can range from anything is um, like they get a letter off in your name or you got your date of birth wrong to um, critical issues with regard to positioning and really critically analyzing the DEXA. So it's a, it's a wide range of potential errors. In a nutshell, you want to use the same facility, you want to use the same scanner, and ideally the same technician. But the way that medicine is today, you more than likely will not get the same technician. Um, these days, we're looking, medicine is looking to generate volume, so moving, 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 and not necessarily um, worried about positioning and taking the time to make sure they're getting um, the appropriate DEXA. There are places that do great quality DEXAs, um, but there are places that don't do good quality. Quality DEXAs. Okay, positioning is important. Um, I always tell patients don't take calcium supplements 24 hours prior to the DEXA because it can um, lead to an erroneous DEXA um, uh, report. Um, 
DEXA does not do well in terms of implants. So if you've had a spinal fusion and you've got metal in your back, um, or you've got um, polymethyl methacrylate, PMMA, which is cement, um, which can be used for vertebral body fractures. Essentially what they do is they inject cement to bring that, that vertebrae back up um, with regard to its height. Um, so DEXA, that is a cause for error, the implants and then the presence of cement. Um, osteo, um, osteoarthritis can cause erroneous DEXAs, which means osteoarthritis produces um, more bone or bone spurs, and that can make your DEXA or your bone mineral density seem higher than what it actually is, okay? There are errors that can be caused by the technician, and the one thing that um, Irma and I talked about recently was discordance. So a lot of people will see on their DEXAs that their spine is one value, like a negative four, and their hips are a negative 2.3 T-score. That does not make sense to me that there should be so much discordance. You really should see something that has less discordance. And I'll talk about REMS, but REMS does not have that same issue as DEXA. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, trabecular bone score, um, that is an added software package to DEXA. When your physician writes a prescription, they have to include TBS, okay, DEXA with TBS. Not all DEXA machines have the TBS, so not all locations have it. Um, like I said, it is an um, additional software package. It is reflective of the bone quality, and it's derived from the analysis of the pixels or the little square uh, digital dots um, on the DEXA image. And it's more predictive of fracture risk than bone mineral density, clinical risk factor, factors and fracs. Um, the TBS value can be added into the FRAC score. So for those of you who like to follow your FRAC score and enter it onto your um, computer, um, it can be added in there and it'll modify your FRAC, um, your uh, risk for fracture based on the BMD and the TBS. Um, it's only done in the spine, so it is not done for the hip. And it's dependent on the image quality and what we call edge detection. Um, uh, vertebral fractures can change, uh, give you an erroneous value, um, and BMI, body mass index, um, can affect it as well. Um, for those of you who are interested in um, learning more about TBS, Dr. Uh, DTA Hans is, um, is the guru with regard to um, TBS, so uh, look for his work. So if I can if I can jump in, the TBS is such an important piece, an important important add on to the DEXA, and it's grueling to try to find a facility that has them. First of all, the techs don't know, many of them don't know, the um, scheduler doesn't know, and even Medimaps, who is trying to help organize and give names and telephone numbers for facilities, they're not accurate. So it's a it's a big it's a big charge for the individual or the consumer to try to get a TBS. But it's so important when you do. So yeah. make that point. That that's a state of medicine these days, Irma. <laughs> I, hate to, I hate to say that, but it it really is. Um, it, it's a reflective of of a bigger problem, a bigger systemic problem. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so let's, this is me kind of getting a little nerdy. Um, so the ISCD guidelines with regard to TBS, um, the TBS is associated with fracture risk in the vertebrae hip and for major osteoporotic fracture in postmenopausal women, and it is associated with fracture risk for hip and major osteoporotic fractures for men over the age of 50. It should not be used alone uh, to determine treatment recommendations. So you, know, you got to take into consider the BMD, bone mineral density, TBS, as well as a complete picture. You're an entire human being, okay? Um, like mentioned before, it can be used to adjust FRAC's probability of the fracture, and the role of TBS in monitoring anti-resorptive uh, therapy is unclear. So your bisphosphonates, it's not really clear how we're going to use um, TBS to monitor those, and um, the thought is it's potentially going to be useful for monitoring anabolic therapies. And to the right of the screen, you'll see a more modernized um, report, the the Previous reports were a little bit different, um, but here you can see that um, Medi Medimaps has um, modified uh, the TBS. Um, at the bottom, bottom left corner of the image, you'll see fracture risk assessment. It's taking into account the BMD as well as the bone quality. Um, 
we're going to move on. And so this is just an example. If you go online and you Google Frax tool, um, you can pull this up um, and you can enter your own values, as well as if you look to the bottom uh, right of the screen, you'll see that you can also enter TBS values if you have that. And that'll modify what your risk um, your risk is for fragility fracture or major osteoporotic fracture, sorry. And they're actually coming out with FRAX 2, which is a little bit more detailed. It's just starting to come online. So you can add one or two of the, um, of the aspects of osteoporosis where FRAX is somewhat limited. So that's just something else to, to consider. Yeah, yeah, no, these are all tools and you know, tools evolve with time. Um, I'm just gonna mention um, opportunistic CT. Um, there are some centers uh, that do opportunistic CT. So for example, if you're going to have surgery and you happen to have um, a CT of your spine or a CT of your abdomen where the spine is included, um, you can have that evaluated um, for assessment of the cortical and the trabecular bone. And it'll give you volumetric assessments, whereas DEXA gives you an aerial assessment. Um, so it can be performed as an opportunistic exam. The cost is higher than a DEXA. Um, serial monitoring using CT is not, not practical. Um, if you are at a location where um, CT is recommended as for serial monitoring, the thing that you really want to consider is the radiation dose and the cumulative effect of that radiation dose. Okay. Um, that's what all I want to say about that in terms of um, application for this talk. Um, and then we're going to talk about some non-ionizing imaging, um, like quantitative ultrasound, and then, of course, REMS. Um, okay, I'm just going to mention MRI. MRI is mainly used in research purposes. It's not really used for um, serial monitoring or for diagnosis of osteoporosis. Okay, quantitative ultrasound. I don't know if, if anybody remembers ever going to like a health screening place where they you put your heel in a device and it tells you, it gives you an indication of whether or not you, you have good bone health or not good bone health. Um, usually the calcaneus is a primary site of assessment, but you can also do the tibia and the fingers. Um, it's not really reproducible. It's not good for um, serial monitoring, but it can be used to... Um, Evaluate, give you a good indication of, hey, maybe I really should go, go get my bones looked at. Um, and it's less sensitive um, than DEXA, but it does correlate with DEXA. Um, so let's just go over what we've already kind of just in a nutshell, what we've talked about. We've talked about DEXA, we've talked about quantitative CT, and we've talked about ultrasound. Each of them has their pros and cons. And really what we want to have is we want to have something that has low radiation, that is sensitive, um, portable or mobile, um, and something that gives us information about the bone quality. And this technology called REMS comes about. Um, it's an ultrasound technology which analyzes the backscatter or the echo um, from an ultrasound. So the way the ultrasound works is you put a transducer or a probe on, on the body, it pulses a sound wave, and then that sound wave echoes off of the tissues. And so it collects information on the echo, and then it mathematically processes the signals um, to give us an idea of what the bone mineral density is, but also the bone quality. Okay, so when you're looking at, if you do start doing your research on REMS and you want to look at some of the, the research that has been done and, and peruse the literature, the bone mineral density estimation is called the osteoporosis score. And then the prediction of fracture risk um, or the, the um, information that we get on the microarchitecture or the quality bone is, is called the fragility score. Um, I just have a few um, research articles uh, listed up there in case you are um, interested in looking those up. Um, there's about three of them listed on that slide. And the advantages of ultrasound technology is there's no radiation, it's low cost, and it's portable. So we can engage more um, populations and we can reach rural populations as well as urban populations. 
And then REMS also expands our ability to screen and monitor bone health over time. So we can use REMS during pregnancy because there's no radiation. Um, we can monitor it through the um, first trimester, the lumbar spine, as well as the hips. After the first trimester, we can only monitor the hips, okay? We can also use REMS in the, um, in the presence of instrumentation. So for somebody like me and Dr. Bush, who's gonna be on this call, um, after fixing a hip fracture, depending on the instrumentation that we use, um, we can still, if there's enough bone present at that hip, we can still analyze that hip using our REMS technology. Um, and then the, fit to is the issues um, that affect patient positioning with DEXA, it's not an issue for REMS. I, I've been able to um, use REMS while standing up, and I've also been using, uh, been able to use REMS in a reclined position. So for patients who are not able to get on a DEXA table, patients who are not very mobile, this expands our ability to monitor bone health. Um, REMS also is not affected by uh, degenerative changes. So osteoarthritis or the bone spurs that occur in the lumbar spine, um, does not affect um, the, the um, results from REMS, okay? Uh, and then the fragility score, this is the, this is the meat. This is what people really come to, to see us for when it comes to the REMS technology. They want to know what the quality of their bone is because they've been told they have osteoporosis. They've been told that they're going to fall apart, that they're going to break a hip and, and deteriorate um, and die. Um, but we need more information, right? 60 to 80% of our bone strength is derived from the bone mineral density. Well, what about what about the remaining 20 to 40%? You know, that has to deal with the microarchitecture of the bone. So the fragility score is a reflection of the microarchitecture of the bone. It's a dimensionless value from zero to 100. So we can talk about this um, in another talk, like really understanding the REMS fragility score. Um, so zero and the REMS fragility score means good or normal microarchitecture. 100 means severely deteriorated, okay? And what this is, is you, you get um, a number which, is, which compares your um, spectrum or your sound waves that come back to reference um, uh, modes. So it compares your value to people who have had a fracture and people who have not had a fracture. And then it puts you on that graph uh, between age and then the REMS fragility score. And it shows you where you are in terms of, do I have normal bone microarchitecture? Do I have partially deteriorated microarchitecture or do I have poor microarchitecture? Am I, am I at risk of fracturing because I have poor microarchitecture? Um, and it is independent of the bone mineral density. So it's a completely different evaluation than the BMD. So here we're, we can look at the fragility score in terms of research, Dr. Pisani, this is published this year, but great study here. Um, what she found that was that the fragility score had superior predictive uh, ability for fracture, uh, fragility fracture when compared to BMD for DEXA and BMD for REMS. So this tells you that your microarchitecture matters. I can pause here so that everybody can write this one down because I think this is really important that the microarchitecture, if you have poor microarchitecture, it increases your risk significantly, it increases your risk for fracture. And then with the RIMS report, similar to the newer TBS, it combines your um, BMD with your fragility score and it puts you into a risk classification. And here's where people really get stuck. And we had a full conversation about this, didn't we, Irma? Um, if you look at the report, report at the bottom, it gives total fracture risk at five years, and it has a zero slash zero zero. That's per 1000. And so what was happening with the R3 category, th this is actually my REMS report. So R3 category, you look at it and you say, oh my God, I'm at four to 8% because that's what I'm used to seeing is, you know, percent, um, four to 8% risk of hip fracture. 
Well, that's that's not the case, right? I have to move the decimal point over. So my risk for fracture, five-year risk of fracture is 0.4 to 0.8. So when people initially looked at the REMS reports, this was very concerning for them. But once we start started to explain that this is a different value than a percent, um, it seemed to calm everybody down. So from, from uh, orthopedic surgeon's perspective, um, future directions with regard to use of this REM te REMS technology is really, we need to explore um, how we monitor treatment with the use of the fragility score. And I do believe that we can start monitoring bone health at younger ages and over a lifetime. We don't do that for DEXA for various reasons, one of them being radiation exposure, um, one of them being, um, you know, we tend to set these guidelines <laughs> um, and really the guidelines indicate postmenopausal women after the age of 65. Well, what about somebody premenopausal? I want to know where I am before I go through it. And, and I'm sure many younger women would like to know it, know that information. I think it's important to start engaging in bone health at younger ages rather than waiting um, until we, we miss the boat on that. Um, it, I think monitoring bone health or uh, um, understanding what the microarchitecture is can be incredibly important for um, surgeons in preoperative planning and optimizing bone um, before we get started with um, total hips or total knees. And then it can also have impact on implant design because oftentimes the metal that we put in the body is a mismatch to the bone. And so if we can start to design implants that match the microarchitecture, we may be able to prevent these horrendous, um, what we call periprosthetic fractures. So I do think there's a lot of opportunity here um, once we start to really understand the impact impact of the fragility score um, and being able to monitor the bone quality over time. So my take home messages to you all is there's various imaging techniques for bone health. There's pros and cons to each of them. And really, if you get a REMS evaluation, please, most people wanna be able to compare DEXA to REMS or two different technologies. Yes, there are similarities, but if you're gonna compare Things over time, you want to compare DEXA to DEXA and REMS to REMS. But most importantly, just recognize that you are a person and what's good for one person may not work for another person. And so I really encourage you um, to learn and grow and engage in optimizing your health because there's nobody who's going to care about your health as much as you do. I'm ready for some questions. Okay. Do you want to turn the... Um... Absolutely. I'll turn screen share off. It says new screen. Stop share. There we go. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to mention. Um, there is a real problem with reimbursement for DEXA. The reimbursement is very, very low. As a result, they don't train, they don't have money to train techs. So techs are often doing other imaging like mammograms. So they don't have proper training. They certainly aren't certified densitometrists. If they are, that's that's most unusual. So that's becoming more and more of an issue within the Medicare world. Um, so that's the first thing that I wanted to mention. And the techs, the techs aren't trained. Um, the loss of height, you, you mentioned that quickly. The loss of height is a real significant indicator. It's one of those at-home studies that you can do. If you're losing height, uh, one to one and a half inches over time, that's something that one has to pay attention to. So how do you properly measure your height? Now, I don't know if you have an answer to that, but I suggest to my people, my bones tribe to put yourself against the wall and put a put something flat on your head, stand up straight and then pencil it like you're doing with a child who's growing and then mark it um, and, and see, because we do compress and we do... <clears throat> over as we as we get eight as we age and we're on the computer so that's a pretty important point. Uh, so Vicky there's somebody who's not on mute who's making some background noise if you could do that uh, okay so do you want to look at the questions we had a couple questions Vicky do you want to present the questions to Dr. Zambito Vicky's on mute sure I can do that um, it looks like everyone's muted so I don't know where that sand came from <laughs> 
Um, so should we start at the beginning? Okay, so do spine fusions and pins affect results other than in the spine? For, so for DEXA, because for DEXA, yes, a spine fusion will affect the results. Um, for REMS, no. Okay. Uh, the question is, what is FRAC score? And we talked about that, but yeah. you want, maybe you want to mention it again because the information was really great, and but it came it came out fast. It so, was a lot. Yeah, it was a lot. So FRAX is a tool, and um, you can get it. You can access it online if you go to Google and you just Google FRAX score. Um, you can. Um, enter your own information. So it asks a series of questions such as any exposure to glucocorticoids, um, any family history of a hip fracture, you know, mother, grandmother. So it'll ask a series of questions. It'll ask your height and your weight. They do have, um, they do have it in the um, kilogram and inch, uh, kilogram and uh, in pounds. You just have to convert it if, if you prefer the U.S. Um, inches and, and um, pounds. Um, and then if you happen to have a DEXA, you can enter your um, femoral neck um, score, um, your grams per centimeter uh, squared. Um, if you have TBS, you can also enter that as well. Um, and then it'll calculate your major osteoporotic fracture risk as well as your hip, uh, femoral neck or hip, hip fracture risk. Most DEXA reports will have that on there um, somewhere on the DEXA report. And it's typically on the two-page report that a doctor will get. It really doesn't know how to read a DEXA, but they're doing that 15-minute thing. So it's like, oh, you need medication. You yeah. don't need medication. But it's typically on that two-page report that you, you see. It's a FRAX, and then it's a FRAX adjusted with a TBS. And you can see that for yourself. Okay, Vic, what else? Hey, what is the nature of the TBS dependency on BMI? So I, I'm not um, I'm not an expert on TBS. Um, BMI affects a lot of imaging studies um, because it has to penetrate through. If you have a large BMI, um, it has to penetrate through a layer of of fat, whether it's um, sup, um, subcutaneous or visceral fat. So having a larger BMI can affect all of these um, these values. And Heather, I will say that there have been a couple people in my community that they were told their BMI is too low and they could not get a TBS. And I challenged that and it doesn't seem to be accurate, but the other aspect, so I don't know the answer to that, but that was one of the challenges that we had. I told her to go back to the technician and her doctor, which she did, and she actually ended up getting a TBS. But one of the other things about a DEXA is for the very short or small women, short. Um, that oftentimes the DEXA is problematic because they're not put on the table right. So being put on the table right for a DEXA, which is very different from the REMS echo light because we don't have that, that you have to have your feet up so your spine is flat, you have to have your feet rotated 15 degrees so that the hips are open and a lot of facilities don't do that. So that's pretty important if you're doing a DEXA to make sure that it's done properly. Now, what do you do if you go there and they don't have the box there? Well, they're not putting your hips, your feet into those straps. It's a challenge. You can say, I'm not going to have a DEXA right now because I want an accurate DEXA. Now, do we have the courage to do that after we've waited three months to get a DEXA? You know, it, it, it adds to the challenge, but we're looking for a good test and that's key. Okay, Vic. Okay. What about CT scans for assessing bone quality. I think you did mention it. Yeah, so CT scans can look at the cortical and the trabecular bone, but I'm going to I'm going to defer any further comments because I don't think it's a great way to really do serial evaluation of CT scans. I think if you're going to have a CT scan to evaluate your bone density and your bone quality, it should be in an opportunistic fashion. So, for example, you're getting a CT scan for your chest, abdomen, pelvis, then, then you can certainly have that evaluated. Um, but that's all I'm gonna say for that. Well, would you say something about this? The you, We were talking about DEXA every two years. Some, some of my clients get it every year. I don't know how they manage. Um, good insurance or the doctor knows how to write us. I don't know. Um, but isn't there the accumulation of X-ray over time with DEXA that one has to just be awake to? 
Am I right on that or is that too insignificant? Right, so I think you get you get more radiation exposure from while going for a walk in the sunlight than you do from a DEXA. The thing is with DEXA, I, I don't understand why somebody would get one every year if the sensitivity of the DEXA doesn't pick up changes unless it's two years apart, unless of course maybe they're on anabolic. So I, I don't know why people are getting it every year um, unless they're they're on some sort of treatment that would indicate closer monitoring and anticipation of changes at the one-year interval. I thought that that was a Medicare rule, that it was every two years, um, because the one client that's being that's coming up for me, she did, there were changes over from year to year. I mean, I get them every two years, and I know that most people do, but I thought that that was a, a Medicare standard with insurance. No, that, that's an ISCD standard. It's every two years. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, Vic, what else? Okay, so if I recently had a CT scan, can cortical trabecular assessment be performed after the fact, or does the bone assessment need to be built into the CT procedure? So that's where the term opportunistic comes in. Um, you, have to, you have to request to have it evaluated and make sure that wherever you had your CT scan, that they have the ability to do that. Um, so... Yes, you can request it, but if the location where you had it doesn't have the ability or the software package to do it, then you might not be able to do that. It's worth an ask. Thank you. Then what if you don't have a T-score for this calculation? What she's referring to. Karen, Karen, I don't know what that means. Does yeah. that mean? Karen, can you be a little bit more clear with that question? What do you mean if you don't have a T-score? I am realizing I misspoke that actually I meant a TBS score, not a T score. Uh, okay. So I have a TB, I have a T score. <laughs> and you're saying what, what, if you don't have a TBS score? I mean, this is this right. Is I was not stuff. able to find a local facility that had the TBS score. People thought I was crazy. They never heard of it. They even, my, even my physician, excuse me, like, was not familiar with TBS scores and she didn't know where I could go to get it. Well, Karen, how come you didn't call me on that? Okay, we'll talk about that offsite. <laughs> because I had my appointment and, you know, it was two years and they say you've got it. But yes, I should have called you on that. Absolutely. But Karen, Karen brings up a point that a lot of people, it's a great data point and a lot of doctors don't know about it and a lot of technicians don't know about it unless the machine unless the, the facility has it. I'm going to just interject a short story. I had taken a road trip. Well, I had a client and she had the TBS score done and it was her two-year time and she got the, the DEXA again. And I said, okay, here's the DEXA. Where's the TBS? She said, they said they don't have it anymore. I said, that's impossible. She said, no, 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 they don't have it anymore. So we took a road trip. I went actually to the facility and I, I asked to speak to somebody in charge. And um, the woman said, can I help you? I said, is it true you don't have a TBS anymore? She said, yeah, we didn't. We, we got a new deck, so we decided we don't need the TBS. I said, you're doing a tremendous disservice to your patients because that's a data point. You want to know the inside of the, of the strength of the bones. So why would you do that? I understand finances, but really what? So I can't refer my clients to you anymore. And she was like, oh, um, so I don't know that that's going to change their opinion on that, but it is it's cost many, many aspects. And I think that that's what Dr. Zambita was alluding to, how we're changing. It's cost derived. So it depends. The The TBS, I think, is a $10,000 software that goes on top of the decks. By the way, if you have a, what I understand, and Sandy could could clear me up if I'm wrong, if you've had a DEXA that has a TBS, but they only gave you the last TBS or the last DEXA with a TBS, you can ask them to go back. If you're going to the same facility, you can ask them to go back and give you history of your of your TBS. And does that make sense? Because once it's there, it's the same facility, same machine, you can request the, uh, the TBS if you want to track your history. Sandy, if I'm wrong on that, would you chime in? Okay, Vic. Okay, if you have the ability to do serial testing with Echo Light, do you need to also do DEXAs from time to time? Is it recommended? So the, <clears throat> there are two different technologies. Um, DEXA has sensitivity, which can pick up changes in two years. REMS has sensitivity, which can pick up changes in six months. 
So if you wanted to use both technologies, what you can do is still get your DEXAs. And then on the off year that you don't get a DEXA, you can do a REMS evaluation so that you can evaluate changes over time, comparing DEXA to DEXA and REMS to REMS. That's such a, a really interesting point. I will continue to get DEXAs. And I was thinking about this. I don't know if you remember. Oh, let me let me go back to a little bit of a story. A long time ago, about 10 or 12 years ago, I went to see Dr. Lauren Fishman in New York City, who wrote the book Osteo Yoga and Osteoporosis. I wanted to meet him. I wanted to talk to him. I was part of his study. And I wanted to ask him all these kinds of questions. He's a very delightfully approachable man, very flexible because he's an Iyengar teacher. So he's lifting up his leg to his nose like an elephant. <laughs> I was like, whoa. And he's not a young man. Um, I was in his study early on. I didn't think it was a good study because um, they weren't they weren't taking proper, they didn't have a clinical densitometrist to input the data. Um, anyway, that's a separate story. But I said to him at that point, I said, you know, it seems that leaky gut seems to be part of a conversation these days. He said, what? What are you talking about? There's no such thing as leaky gut. What are you, you're talking about like all of a sudden food particles are getting into the system? I said, yeah. Now, he was not a believer of that. And I appreciated his challenge, but now we're hearing leaky gut, leaky gut is part of a conversation when we come down to uh, digestive issues. So I'm thinking that Echolite may become another one of these instruments that with time, with experience, that will be a dependable device. As I said, I'll continue to take DEXA, I'll continue to take Echolite because I'm, I collect my data. Okay, what else, Vic? Okay, are you going to have another day doing REM scans in New Hope Could we that we could sign up for? <laughs> <laughs> Irma and I have some conversations to be had, so we'll, we'll get back to you on that. Okay. So we, we had opened up the day one day with 13 slots, and they filled in a day and a half. Um, and people were doing long distance. They would come, two people were coming from Massachusetts. So... Um, and also a lot of people remember Dr. Zambito, so they wanna be in her in her company again. So we're gonna figure it out what to do and we'll let you know. So you know what I need to do? I need to put the link in there. Um, Lisa, I'm gonna put the link in there for you to get on the wait list. So please continue with the conversation and I'll get the link for the wait list, Vicki. Yeah, I think I already am on the wait list. Thank you very much. I, I think I tried to sign up for it. I, I'm just dying to get another round with Dr. Sambito after having done it twice. And I would love to, I hope she's going to start doing this a lot. And this is a wonderful evening. Thank you, by the way. You're welcome, Lisa. Um, I had a technical problem with the with my setting up the, the consultations. And um, so it just required a little bit more hands-on work than my, I thought an automated system would take care of. <laughs> okay. So just to put it out there, um, Dr. Bush and I are doing um, seminars throughout the country. Uh, we don't have our calendar put out yet, but we are in the process of working through that. And we should have um, our list of locations, dates, and times sometime at the beginning of the new year. So just stay tuned with us. We do have um, a Facebook page called REMS Discussion Group um, that we'll post on that. And then um, also some other various social media sites like Dr. Bush's um, website, Central Carolina Orthopedics. So stay tuned. We will be doing a traveling road show, <laughs> um, but we, we also have our individual setups um, at our locations too. So the, the road show is going to be about teaching or about um, performing the runs? Uh, both. Great. Okay. Can you explain more about how spine arthritis does not interfere with REMS? So that's really getting into the technical aspects of the, the um, technology itself. Um, but if we, if we simplify it, what it does is there's a an echo, similar to echoing into a chamber or echoing into a cliff. Well, that sound that comes back to you is a little bit different than the sound that you put out. And so what happens is the artificial technology, which is inside the REMS uh, device, it takes that sound that echoes back and then it characterizes that sound. So different tissues make different sounds. We're just gonna call it sounds. So fat makes a sound, bone makes a sound. Um, 
osteoarthritis, like the osteophytes, those make a sound. So what happens is that sound, the sound waves get characterized and placed in a bucket. So the up oh, the sound wave is fat. Up oh, the sound wave is muscle. Up oh, the sound wave is you know vertebral body. Up oh, the sound wave is an osteophyte. So it it categor categorizes that and then it eliminates everything that is. I'm going to use the word nonsense when it comes to the the BMD and then the microarchitecture. And then there's some calculations that happen and then it it comes up with the uh, the calculation of bone mineral density and then the the fragility score. Does does that make sense? I'm trying to simplify <laughs> simplify the technology. I'm not sure if it if I explained it in such a way that makes sense. That, it, Deb, does that make sense to you? Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm going to put two questions together. How often do you need to get a REMS, and where can you get a REMS? So, with regard to the sensitivity of REMS, it can pick up changes at six months within six months. It's that sensitive. Um, I think getting a REMS evaluation every six months is, is overkill. Um, if you want to get it once a year or once every other year, which is the standard with DEXA, once every other year, I think that's fine. The key is monitoring your bone health. Right. So, and where can you get it? Someone else also asked, is it available in the Boston area? So, so it's not available in the Boston area as far as we know. Um, but we will be doing a little trip to Boston at some point in the near future. So stay tuned. Okay. Um, so it, uh, oh, someone asked about San Francisco. So we'll just have them stay tuned. Um, <laughs> is there a reason more people fracture with osteopenia than osteoporosis just because so many more people have osteopenia than osteoporosis? How do, do the percentages compare? I think that's best for another talk because I have my thoughts on that, but I think some of the, some of it has to do with the errors on the DEXA. Um, so it could be that somebody actually is osteoporotic, but because they have osteophytes or, or arthritis that falsely elevates their, um, their T-score, which puts them in the osteopenia category when really they should be in the osteoporosis category. So that's one thought. So, I mean, that yeah. is that is such a question to really explore, but I think I think that response and that that I think is what kind of explains what's going on. I also think that um, when somebody's told that they have osteoporosis um, and that they're going to break and they live life in fear, they're a little more cautious than somebody who's like, oh, I got normal bone density, or hey, I've got you know just bo low bone density. So I think there's a little bit of um, adaptation that goes along with being told, hey, you have osteoporosis. Um, so I think that that's how that, that plays out. Okay. So um, why is the T-score sometimes higher on DEXA and lower on REMS? T-score higher on DEXA. Do you mean lower, like more negative? That's from Cheryl Edwards. So higher on DEXA, we already talked about that in terms of osteoarthritis, giving a falsely elevated T-score mm -hmm. for DEXA. So DEXA is affected by osteoarthritis, which will give you a, a more, a higher T-score or higher BMD, whereas REMS, it's not affected by arthritis. So you might get a lower T-score or a lower BMD on REMS because it's not affected with arthritis or by arthritis. I hope I answered your question. Carol? Yes, she did, thank you. Okay. Uh, I have osteoporosis in my femoral neck, but the DEXA shows not, no osteoporosis or osteopenia. I've learned that this is because I have scoliosis. Will the TBS score also be affected by my scoliosis? Let me, can I clarify that? I, I sure. meant to say in my spine, it didn't show any osteoporosis or osteopenia. I left that out. So, so TBS would be affected because it's dependent on the positioning and the edge detection on the DEXA. So yes, I, I would have to see your DEXA to really make any comments, but 
but any scoliosis can can change your DEXA report. So it's not incredibly reliable. With REMS, I can modify where the, the position of the transducer so I can optimize and place it over that individual vertebrae. That's that's another benefit with the REMS technology. But the, but the TBS score won't necessarily be very accurate because of, uh, of scoliosis. Is that correct too? So it depends on the quality of the DEXA. So TBS is oh. dependent on the quality of the DEXA. So if the DEXA is not performed optimally, oh, then TBS okay. is going to be is not going to be an accurate depiction of what of what you're hoping for. I see. Okay. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. yeah. Um. So is REMS test preferable to a TBS test? So, so TBS is a software package on the DEXA and it only looks at the lumbar spine. I believe they're, they're working on software that'll look at um, other parts of the, like the femoral neck and the distal third radius, but I, I'm not, I'm not um, privy to the information by those who are developing the TBS. Um, for REMS, REMS will look at, give you information on the microarchitecture of the spine and the hip. So REMS gives you more information if, if that's what you're asking. Okay. How valuable is a TBS if you have significant arthritis in your spine? I think I've already answered that question mm -hmm. with regard to the quality of the DEXA and TBS is dependent on the quality of the DEXA. Hmm. Um, Cost of REMS and is it covered by insurance? So REMS right now is not covered by insurance. Um, we have explored. So with regard to insurances, there has to be a code like a CPT code or a procedural code. And right now there's no procedural code that is um, associated with, with REMS. Um, if a physician wants to use a CPT code, they're looking at an unspecified um, ultrasound code, which it's hit or miss in terms of reimbursement. Um, so cost of REMS, it's going to vary depending. There are some other places that are doing uh, REMS. Um, Dr. Bush and I are doing it um, at a certain cost. If you're interested, it's, and it's very affordable, it's um, consistent with a copay for a DEXA. Um, so if you're interested in that, I would contact Central Carolina Orthopedics for pricing. And if we are traveling to far locations, we have to include that into our price structure. So I put the link in the chat if anybody wants to be on the wait list, if we open up another day to do the REMS in New Hope. Okay, Vicki. Okay. And we're out of time. Oh we're God. getting close to the end. I'm just trying to grab a few here. Um, uh, do, 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 do. People want to know where you're located, Dr. Zambito, but I don't know. If... So I, I am a hand surgeon. I work for St. Luke's University Health Network, and it's only for hand surgery. Um, I am not hired to do bone health for St. Luke's. Um, so for those who've been calling St. Luke's, <laughs> um, everybody's asking, you know, what this REMS technology is. I do hope to bring it to St. Luke's at some point, um, trying to work through any type of hospital system. Um, it's, it's like moving a mountain one pebble at a time. It, it'll happen, but it just takes time. Um, so for now, I'm working with Irma, and then I'm working with another local physician um, um, in the area. And then, of course, the, the, traveling, the traveling opportunities that Dr. Bush and I are doing together. Um, Dr. Bush does do REMS at his office in Central Carolina. And Lisa Sandberg, thank you so much for Stephen Honig's name from Langone, NYU Langone. I didn't realize that he has a TBS DEXA in, in his office, so this is very helpful. Okay, Vic, anything else? Um, do you need to have a physician read and interpret the REMS scores? So I, I do offer to... So when I do the REMS evaluation and when Dr. I can only speak to me for me and Dr. Bush, when I do them and when Dr. Bush do that, does them, we briefly go over, hey, this is your result. If you want a more in-depth conversation, it's a separate 
um, appointment for a consultation. And it's focused for me, it's focused mainly on educating you and empowering you so that you can make decisions that are right for you. Dr. Bush does do full consultations, which would be evaluating your medical um, history, surgical history, more in depth um, at his office location in um, Central Carolina. So this is interesting what CGA just put in. My doc considers the femur score more important predictively than the lumbar. Do you agree? I think that's a reasonable um, statement uh, because there's so many errors with regard to the lumbar spine and performing that for the, for the DEXA. I think that's reasonable. Interesting. Did I miss anything, Vicki? No, I think we've covered most things. I mean, there's some comments listed in here. Um, someone does mention there's someone who does it in Black Mountain, North Carolina, near Asheville. So. Right. right, but doesn't have the, just performs the tests and doesn't do the, um, the reading of the tests, if, if I understand. The person interpreting the results is a chiropractor. He, does, he, he talked to us about 20 or 30 minutes after the results came out. Who is that speaking? Adair. Okay. All right. So Betty Ann and I both went to this guy and um, it was right here where we live. So we thought we'd do that. But I, I agree with the question. Do I need to have a physician interpret it as well? Because it was different. It was, it said I have osteopenia. The DEXA said I have osteoporosis. So it all depends on what you're you're looking for in terms of spending your time with a physician. Um, both Dr. Bush and I have have reviewed DEXAs with uh, patients, and we've reviewed the REMS, and then just kind of explain things and educate. Um, so it just depends on what you're looking for. Some people just want to get the test and, you know, that's that. Other people want a little more, a little more time uh, with their physician. Um, so it just depends. Dr. Bush and I have done more of these evaluations in this country than anybody else. I was the, the first one in this country to get it. Dr. Bush was the second. So um, we probably have the most experience in the U.S. Okay. Anything else? Irma, do you want to scan through and see if there's anything that I missed? Um, I'm just sending a, a private message. Um, I think that we're good. Uh, yeah, I think. We're good. So um, thank you, everybody, for being on the call. Thank you, Dr. Zambito. I don't know that Dr. Bush was. was I he? didn't see him. Okay. Um, I hope that this was helpful. What I'd like to do is if you could put in the chat, I know this is a big question and it's late in the day, but if you could put in the chat one thing that you took away from the call, that would be very, very interesting for us. Um, again, if you want to be on the uh, wait list to come to New Hope, I put the link in the in the chat. I'll drop it again. It would be helpful if Dr. Zambito could include the web, the Facebook page where she's going to have the tour of uh, REMS availability around the country. I'll put it, I'll type it in right now. REMS, REMS discussion group is the, um, the Facebook group. And then there's And then Central Carolina Orthopedics, Dr. Butch has a web page, and so they'll be advertising on those uh, locations. And then we'll also be partnering with other people as as time goes goes on. Thank you. I just want to add that Facebook uh, group is just a great information source. Also, it's really interesting to follow if anyone's interested in the REMS. Uh, it's a wonderful page, so check it out. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Dr. Zambito is an excellent presentation, but it's Echolite REMS discussion group. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Andy. There you are. <laughs> this is Dr. Bush. <laughs> That's cool.
You want to say I'll type it. I'll type it in. So I had one question. When you're doing the echo light, do you do you measure it from the probe from the belly button? How do you know if what part of the spine you're getting? Right. So there there are um, landmarks that we use um, with regard to anatomy. Every surgeon understands landmarks. So uh, your belly button or your umbilicus, as, as if we want to use medical terms, is at the L3 level. Um, so what we do is we place the transducer or the probe at the umbilicus, and then you identify L3, um, you walk it up to L2 and then I, um, to L1, and then the landmark that I use on L1 when I look at the ultrasound image is I can see the edge of the liver. Um, so that's how I, I evaluate that. And then when, when I walk it down L1, 2, 3, 4, 4 kind of tilts downward, um, so that's that's how I know which vertebrae I'm, I'm imaging. So there's no there's no box that you have to put your leg on so the spine is flat. There's no, no. right. It's a very very simple procedure. So when you come to our home, you're going to have people on the yoga table. Excuse me, on the massage table, and then you're going to do your thing. And it's mm -hmm. relatively I don't want to say easy because I'm not doing it, but it's it's not the deck. So we have to make sure that everybody's lined up while they following mm -hmm. the um, the template. Okay. Yeah, we'll make sure you're comfortable. You can put a pillow underneath your knees. Um, you just wear comfortable clothing. Um, I do use, um, ultrasound gel. Um, for those of you who've had babies, you already have experienced the slimy gel on your abdomen. Um, it's, it's relatively easy. We could chit chat about whatever you want. If you want to talk about, you know, shoe shopping or your kids or grandkids, <laughs> you know, it's, we've got 15 minutes to chit chat while I do the test. And more importantly, is that gel warmed up? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. You think I should get a gel warmer, Irma? <laughs> For those highly sensitive people like myself. Um, so we have the moment with Dr. Bush. Does anybody have any questions for him? Because this is a, a wonderful opportunity. Um, so Dr. Bush has been working with Dr. Zambito. Would you put your finger over the phone there? Over, okay. We're getting Dr. Bush back. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Bush? And you can unmute yourself and just join, jump in. Don't be shy. Oh, excellent lecture. I learned a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Zavita. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. <laughs> Dr. Bush, as a fellow North Carolinian, is it possible to, to set up an appointment with you or are you booked way out? You know, uh, out of state are booked out pretty far because of how it's set up. But in state, um, it's just a couple of weeks. It's not a whole lot. And if you um, if you if you don't mind coming over to Sanford, I mean, I'm in Sanford, so it's a couple hour drive from from Asheville. Um, I'm happy to meet with you. If you want to do a telehealth, we could just go over your report. I mean, so so you can leave it up to how how you like to do it. But if if you wanted to come over for an appointment, if you just call the office up, and I'd um, be happy to see you. All right. Thank you. I'm going to say thank you too because I'm in Rock Hill and uh, and I've been googling while we've been talking. So yeah, I'm going to try to get an appointment later this week to come see you. Thank you. There you go. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, Dr. Bush's telephone number is has been put on the. Really, you want your telephone? Oh, that's your office number. <laughs> <laughs> um, My telephone number has been posted in the emergency room, so half of Sanford probably has it. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody drives from Florida to get her rims. Yeah. So, um, okay. Thank you. Thank you for Dr. Bush for showing up and thank you, Dr. Zambito for your presentation and everybody on the call. Oh, there's a hand raise. Chrissy has a hand up. Can you go off mute? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm just so happy to hear that they might be traveling. Uh, is it approximate time you might come to San Diego area? <laughs> I like warm, sunny weather. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's not out of the, out of question. It's just, um, like I said, we're planning, we're planning 2024. Um, so it, it, there's a possibility. I, I have a place for you to stay. I know. <laughs> okay. Good a condo. Good. 
if, if you if you can um, get a good group of people, um, you know, I would say, Dr. Bush, how many do you think um, to get out there? Well, it probably would be good to have a weekend. You know, if we came out on Thursday and did Friday, Saturday, Sunday or something like that, that would be uh, it would be good for us. So but, but we're probably going to talk to some of the folks in, in um, St. Louis and see what about the facilities that might be out near San Diego. And that might be one way of doing it where we work with one of the Osteo Strong or the other facilities. So that might be something we, we look at. Yeah, for, for yeah, a trip they, like that, we're, we're looking, Yeah, you know, we need to see, you know, 100 people um, just honestly to cover costs for, you know, flying out there um, in hotel. So it has to, it has to be a good number of people. Yeah, LA would be fine too. Okay. Okay. What, what about, can you like do it at Scripps or, you know, Scripps mm -hmm. Hospital? Um, probably not at a hospital okay. setting, um, given the regulations that happen at a hospital um, okay. in terms of um, getting privileges and, and what have you. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. And lastly, CJ was asking, is there a web page that explains the REMS technology? If you, if you know one and you could put that in the chat, that would be great. So to explain the REMS technology, like a, like a video, because the Echolite REMS um, company has a, has a small, you know, short video on the technology itself. I think reading about the technology and the research behind it is probably the best way to go. And those were featured in the slides, like some of the, the references. Can you think of anything, Andy? Well, also the, our Facebook page. If you go back over a year ago, that's how we started was to go over um, what REMS is like yelling into a canyon and then um, we had your your slide deck from, from back then and we had some stuff from, from Equilite so you go back to about March of 2022 you can really go start go seeing how we've developed and we're explaining REMS over the course of, of, of the year so that if that would be I think a good way now Dr. Zambito's posts are more reasonable being a couple paragraphs mine go on for five pages so it depends what you like to read but uh, um so Lisa, you'll get a synopsis of what their technology is and broken down into, into individual posts. Um, Lisa was asking how we can advocate for REMS to get more widespread uses. And I think that that's what's happening with Dr. Zambito and Dr. Bush. Um, they're, they're working the field. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to thank everybody for their time and um, say goodbye. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Arma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very informative. Bye. Bye. Thank you.